so thank you guys for being flexible this morning. Uh, we're going to actually mix things up a little bit because we have uh, with us Dana, uh, Dr. Dana Tobin, who is uh, an addition to the WSSI team um, uh, earlier this uh, this year in 2022. Uh, she has um, she comes from us uh, from the University University of Pennsylvania, and she has been a fantastic addition. She's bringing all kinds of travel expertise um, to the WSSI and she is and, and WPC at, at large. And she is focusing on the, the travel component of the WSSI and, and adding some incredible logic there. So with that, I'm going to kick it over to Dana uh, to start, and then we'll backtrack and talk about uh, the probabilistic WSSI. Um, Dana, do you want to go ahead and take it away? Yeah, okay, uh, I'll, sure. I, I'll, I'll uh, run your slides and then just let me know. OK, can you hear me OK? Yep. OK, cool. Um, one correction, it's not University of Pennsylvania, it's Penn State. So. Dang it, I knew I was going to mess that up. Sorry. That's that's totally fine. If, if people want to think I'm from UPenn, that's fine. <laughs> um, so uh, we have been working on um, a special iteration of WSSI um, called WSSI Travel. Um, the caveat here is that this, is, this product is internal National Weather Service only. It's still a prototype in development. Um, we are hoping to get these updates um, live in the next week or so. Um, so this is very exciting and timely, um, and hopefully this will be a, a really uh, exciting product for everybody to use. And of course, my dog is going crazy in the background, so hopefully that's not too distracting. Um, so WSSI Travel is going to have hourly outputs, and it's going to run concurrent and based on um, the HER model. Um, and the updates that we've made to WSSI Travel is that now we are going to be able to display accumulated snow and accumulated ice impacts um, with the same thresholds as the operational WSSI. And uh, we've made some new updates to the precipitation rate components of WSSI travel. So we have added a liquid rate component that will encompass impacts due to rain and also freezing rain and drizzle. Um, so the WSSI travel um, will now include impacts from all cool season precipitation events. Um, and we're going to make it so that users can visualize areas of mixed precipitation. Um, so where we have a mixed, an area of mixed rain and also with snow. We also have the impacts based on uh, precipitation type, intensity, other weather conditions, and also road surface condition and time of day. Um, we have incorporated road surface conditions. Um, so for example, wet, slushy, icy, snowy um, for untreated road surfaces that are being parameterized using probabilistic sub-freezing road or ProbSR outputs. Uh, we've also included time of day influences that are based on a combination of crash risk, crash severity, and traffic volumes um, that are typically present um, for each hour of the day in local time so that we can account for diurnal impacts to surface transportation. We also include weekday versus weekend and holidays. Um, so those, those factors are also accounted for and could be slightly different so that we can um, account for the impacts due to morning rush hours um, and, and travel of that sort. Um, we also have a WSSI travel story map um, that would be clickable once these slides are available um, to you guys. So we encourage you to check that out. Next slide, Josh. Um, so on the bottom left here, we have um, just, a, again, a prototype um, visualization concept that we're, we're trying to work with um, where the solid um, colors are the impacts um, owing to um, snow precipitation. The um, dotted colors um, closer to the coast on the southeast there um, are owing to the impacts of liquid precipitation. And where you see the overlap of the liquid and um, snow impacts, we have cross hatching. And I would uh, demarcate where we have regions of the mixed precipitation impacts. Um, we do have the link to the web page. Um, Josh, do you, do you need to share the, the login information for that one, or is that, is that fine? The, uh, the, uh, the credentials are the standard winter weather desk uh, credentials to, to get to that page. Okay. Um, and so, again, we will, we're still working on the updates to the algorithms, um, but the data will be flowing there very soon. Um, again, uh, keeping the caveat that it is um, National Weather Service internal for the moment. Um, so 
on the top right portion there, um, we have just examples of um, what the time of day curves are looking like for um, snow on the left and also liquid precipitation on the right. Um, you'll notice that the liquid precipitation includes um, two separate time of day curves um, based on if the HER is identifying um, freezing precipitation versus if the HER is identifying liquid rain precipitation. Um, so looking at the, the snow curves, um, what you see here is that um, essentially throughout the, um, the middle, um, the midday hours, um, two inches an hour of snow is roughly going to correspond to extreme impacts if the um, other weather conditions are also adverse. So for example, if there is snow on the road, and if visibility is decreased, which as you would typically expect, there should be um, for two inches an hour of snowfall. So that would lend itself to having extreme impacts being triggered for the midday hours. However, if you look at um, the overnight, really early in the morning hours, um, so for example, between two and three in the morning, um, two inches an hour of snow is only going to trigger major impacts. Um, so those that's typically how we would um, interpret these time of day curves. Um, so th those are buried in the algorithms as well. Um, so we're hoping that these curves, again, are also going to be uh, weather service internal and not shareable to the public. And Josh, that, that's all I had for this. Thank you. Oh, you're muted. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dana, for joining us. And um, um, yeah, if um, I, I will forward along any questions that we get from the group later today. So thank you so much. All right, so we're gonna back up um, and talk. Here's a quick preview. Uh, just um, the WSSI updates and the probabilistic uh, WSSI updates now. So once again, thank you, Dana, and sorry for the Penn State gaffe. I feel like uh, such a dork, uh, that's, that's my bad. Um, all right, so moving on. So uh, as many of you are familiar with, um, overview of the WSSI is to summarize multiple winter weather impacts from a storm into an easily consumable graphic. Currently, we have 24-hour breakouts and a 72-hour summary forecast. Uh, here on the right, you'll see a preview of what the new static images uh, with the new definitions look like. We're going to get into that in, uh, in a second here. And just as a reminder, the, the components of the WSSI are snow amount, snow load, ice accumulation, blowing snow, ground blizzard, and flash freeze. Um, so after working with um, a, a team of social scientists from the Nature Nurture Center, um, we've completely overhauled the definitions uh, of the WSSI this year. Um, this has been a multi-year effort and we've worked with um, folks from all over the country uh, and focus groups and uh, at, at various levels of partnership from um, you know, emergency managers up to, um, to um, uh, folks in big business. So this is, this is exciting. We've had a lot of input on this. Uh, and a couple of the changes you'll notice right away, uh, A, um, we are really kind of travel and daily life focused in these definitions. We've removed some of that more intense language and the moderate, major, and extreme categories. Um, and we've also removed the limited category um, and we've replaced it with a winter weather area. And this is just serves as a reminder, situational awareness footprint area of where there is snow in the grids or a ground blizzard in the grids, but it, it's not living up to the expectations of a full blown, um, uh, of, of fully being impactful. It doesn't rise to the level of that yet. So um, our impact levels are really starting at minor going forward. Um, we've also had some major algorithm improvements um, to the snow amount, uh, ground blizzard. Uh, we've also done some tweaks to blowing stone ice uh, accumulation, uh, which I will go over here in just a second. Uh, and as you saw before, we have new static images. Uh, and uh, REST services for GIS users as well. Uh, so the snow component update. Um, so we are now incorporating frequency into the previous climatology. And we've also, um, we've also tamped down the influence of standard deviation uh, compared to the previous build of the climatology. Um, this version is more rooted in the actual percentiles of the data. Um, of the actual uh, observed snowfall, um, and it, like I said, it incorporates uh, it incorporates frequency uh, by grouping the the data together um, by areas of, of common um, 
snowfall frequency in a 48 hour period. So what we've done is we've split the country into two, two um, big zones, west and east, uh, and that line is at 105 degrees west. Um, and then which, within each of those two larger zones, we've broke them down into 15 subzones uh, based on frequency. What this really helps allow for is, is a more regionally driven um, subclimatology within the WSSI now. So the Great Lakes behave much more similar um, to the to themselves than compared to the rest of the uh, the eastern part of the U.S. Um, out west, the mountains behave much drastically different um, than they did before, um, and the Mid Atlantic is now kind of uh, behaves a little bit separately um, than what it did before. So. So that additional regionality based on uh, snow frequencies really helped. It's also helped spread these big snow um, uh, systems across the zone so that one spot isn't punished forever in its snow climatology, which helps remove some of those that pocketiness that you could see in the previous climatology. Uh, we also used uh, machine learning, a random forest regression um, 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 algorithm this year to help predict those values, especially on the border of these zones to help make things smoother. Uh, and in areas of complex terrain, it's really helped quite a bit, um, uh, especially when a station is starting to move up in elevation. Uh, so the goal of this was to really, a couple, we wanted to keep moderate relatively similar. Uh, we wanted to reduce the minor thresholds. We had some great feedback from um, some offices in central region about um, the minor threshold just being too hard to get to. Um, uh, and that was, you know, in some cases in parts of Michigan, for example, it was six to eight inches, which was just a little bit, a little bit much to get to. Um, so we've lowered the, those minor thresholds for the snowier parts of the country. Um, generally, uh, you're, you're kind of looking at like one to four inches um, across the, the, the central U.S., which you'll see here in a second. But we also wanted to um, make extreme thresholds harder to get to. Um, so based on um, the, that previous slide now, we're, we're in the far right tail of the distribution of snowfall at any given point uh, um, in the country when, when you see extreme now. It should be very near record uh, uh, breaking uh, amounts, if not uh, exceeding record breaking amounts. So extreme should be much harder to get to from the snow amount um, component uh, this year. Uh, here are these thresholds. Um, uh, this is for minor uh, snowfall here. Um, a bulk, of a, a bulk of the central uh, part of the U.S. is going to be between two and four inches, uh, with only the uh, parts of the upper peninsula of Michigan um, exceeding four inches. Uh, but for, and for the most part here, we're looking at two to four inches of snow to get to minor. Uh, moderate snowfall thresholds are going to look somewhat similar to what uh, the previous uh, build looked like, uh, generally four to six inches um, across a good swath of the central U.S., uh, bumping up to six to eight inches for parts of uh, northern uh, as you get into the Great Lakes essentially. Uh, major snowfall threshold looks like this and then extreme threshold you'll see this is where the the numbers are going to be much more significant um, than they were in the previous builds. Um, you might recall um, you know you had values of like 17 18 inches um, that were uh, at the with the extreme threshold in the previous build. Those have all been bumped up to at least 18 inches for the vast majority of the central region. So ground blizzard overhaul um, is the next thing we're going to talk about. This was brought up to us by um, some of the, the hosts of this uh, <laughs> of, of this seminar here today. Um, it was brought to our attention. It just really wasn't performing well. A group of SUS reached out to draw our attention to this, but not they didn't stop there. They also provided a potential solution on how we could make it better. So. Um, the test cases we, we reviewed resulted in a much more um, congruent, continuous, <laughs> realistic looking um, uh, um, ground blizzard uh, output uh, that was much more in line with expectations. Uh, so the highlights of what we've done here are, <coughs> pardon me, are, it's a better align it to the Bagley method. Um, we're using air temperature instead of snow temperature. We're using wind speed instead of wind gust. Uh, and the new wind speed classification uh, starts at 15 knots before it started at one knot. So that's why at times, you know, North Dakota, South Dakota, Northern Minnesota, were just under constant ground blizzard. And that's because the, um, uh, the, the, in, in the introductory threshold was just far too low. Uh, so we've, we've pumped that up quite a bit higher and uh, the early results seem pretty good. Uh, here's an example of what the old method from a storm in January 3rd uh, of 2022 looks like compared to the new method. You can see scours out a lot of this um, asparagus data. Um, 
a lot of that had to do with the temperature data uh, coming from the snow. Um, and then the, the footprint you can see is greatly reduced and that's really a function of the, uh, um, the higher uh, wind speed threshold. A couple other things real quick before we move on to PROB. Um, the static images are completely overhauled this year. You'll notice that they include the full definition set. Uh, and we've also done a big quality of life improvement. Um, the times and the uh, the valid times and the issued times are now all in, are all um, time zone aware. So if your office is in the central region, you'll see uh, these times reflected in central time. Uh, if you're in the mountain time zone, you'll see the mountain time zone. Eastern time zone will still be the same, of course, but yeah, so that's what the, these look like. And here's a couple of, of recent images um, from earlier in October. Um, we had that early snow load case across Northern Michigan uh, that really lit up the, uh, the algorithms there with some leaves still on the trees. So moving on to probabilistic WSSI. Um, the probabilistic WSSI uses the exact same algorithms as the uh, regular WSSI uh, and the same non-meteorological data. Um, where the PROB WSSI really uh, thrives is as a short to medium range situational awareness tool. Um, it updates four times daily right now at 13Z, 17Z, 1Z, and 5Z. Those are when the cycles are initiated. Uh, and the web page uh, and output generally updates about 90 minutes to uh, 120 minutes after that. Um, what we're providing is the probability of impact guidance. So it's going to help answer questions like how likely is an impact from a winter storm for these various categories or or restated, what is the probability of a major impact? Um, here we see an example to the right. This is the probability of minor impacts um, uh, for, this is the 144 hour forecast from last night. So there is a, starting to be a signal for, for a storm uh, next week at some point across the, the high plains and northern plains. Uh, the PROB WSSI is generated from six hour forecast from the WPC Super Ensemble, uh, which is the same ensemble that's used to generate the PWPF guidance. So it's the same model, same membership, all that. Uh, and that's comprised of CAMs, global deterministics, and, and global ensemble members. Uh, the probabilities are generated for minor, moderate, major, and extreme. You'll note here that they are not uh, generated for the limit, the old limited or the winter weather area. We only start at the minor impact level. Uh, and we also have com the components in the PROB WSSI are snow amount, snow rate, snow load, blowing snow, ice accumulation, and then an overall component. You'll note here that the snow amount and snow rate are separated in the PROB WSSI. Um, so you'll, you'll get specific probabilities for the snow amount, which is the climatology that we discussed earlier, and then the snow rate as well. Uh, so this is kind of a conceptual overview of what the, the PROB WSSI looks like here. We have um, ensemble, all, the, all the various ensemble members are calculating individual WSSI uh, forecasts. Uh, and then the probabilities reflect a number of scenarios um, um, that are um, uh, from that ensemble that are giving the, a similar forecast out of the total membership. So the impact scale with PROB WSSI, you might remember that that's grayed out. Uh, it's still using the same wording as the deterministic WSSI, but the colors used in PROB WSSI at this point are, are um, uh, communicating likelihood of impact. Now we've had some great suggestions um, to use a um, a, a color uh, an individual color scale for each of the components that are, are or each of the impact levels that would match up with the colors. That's something we're in the very early stages of playing around with, but um, so you could see some changes to that in the future. But for, for now, on the probabilistic side, uh, the color is associated with the likelihood of the impact. Uh, so here's just some, some generic output from early last season, um, just showing the minor, moderate, and major impact levels. Um, the minor, I find, is, is very useful to kind of get an envelope or, or footprint of where the impacts are gonna be. So once you start to see those higher levels of, um, of uh, probability, like say 60 or above, that's where you can be confident that kind of the envelope is gonna be. The moderate impacts are, should start to be where you're, you're seeing headlines, whether it be advisories or, or winter storm watches. Um, that's typically gonna line up pretty well with where your moderate impact level is. And then your major impact level is kind of where, where, the, where PROB WSSI thinks it's gonna be the absolute worst based on, uh, based on the ensembles. So forecast times, um, I'm gonna just kind of 
quickly go through this. We're going to change this because it's terrible. Uh, we've had comments <laughs> after every one of these that like, hey, you guys should change this. And I agree. We're, we're working on uh, the best way to do this. Uh, we have one more uh, regional um, um, conference that we're, we're going to later this week. And then we're going to kind of collect all the uh, all the feedback and, and decide which way to go. But uh, for now, the time is communicated um, in this initialized forecast hour and then valid. And what what this is all trying to communicate is, is um, this is a 24 hour rolling um, forecast. So what that means is starting at hour 24, they'll get a six hour update um, for a new 24 hour period. So if you just focus on the valid time, that's where, that's where things will be safest. <laughs> um, the, the forecast initialized is really just where the, the model and initialization time. So if you really just focus on the valid time, just know that that's the 24 hour period uh, of interest. Uh, the web page, um, quickly through here. Um, so the web page uses a variety of um, tabs and buttons and slider bars to, to kind of put together the image that you're looking for. Uh, in the black box up top here, that's the actual component. So if you click on the text in there, that'll load in the proper image that you seek. Um, the default is to come in at the overall winter storm impacts at the moderate uh, impact threshold. You can change that impact level by selecting the various radio buttons. Um, anytime you click one of those, the, the, the new probabilities will be refreshed. Uh, and then to move forward and back in time, you can use the slider bar either by click and dragging with your mouse the arrow buttons to the left of the slider bar or the greater than or less than um, key, um, keys on your keyboard. Um, one thing that uh, sometimes gets lost because it's kind of underneath the map um, is the map overlays. So if you're interested in putting on state boundaries or public forecast zones or um, CWA boundaries, those are all options plus a couple other things that you can add to this map to, to, to make the image uh, a little bit um, uh, to, to throw on these different layers uh, that you might want to when you're um, communicating with others. Uh, and right now we do have a print button, but it just creates a, a PDF, um, which I find less useful. Uh, so the old SNP tool um, is, is probably the most useful way to, to grab this uh, imagery right now. Um, hopefully that'll be changing um, in the future, um, but for right now that's probably the easiest way to go. Um, so this is just different impact levels. Uh, for time's sake, I'm going to move on here. Um, but this is just the, the various envelopes from moderate, major, and extreme from that big storm across mid-April last year um, across the Dakotas. Uh, and likewise, this is just an example of how multiple components can make up the overall impact. In this case here, we see snow mountain snow rate are the primary drivers for this image. Um, so just some other quick other information. Um, we're going to have rolling 48 hour and rolling 72 hour windows available on the PWSSI website, the Prop WSSI website later this season. I'm hoping by Thanksgiving that that will be in place. We're also gonna have GIS files for the rolling 24 hours uh, and both KML and shapefile. Uh, there's a large verification effort ongoing right now that Dana is actually helped leading. Um, so we're gonna help to provide guidance on when there's a reliable signal from Prop WSSI, um, um, you know, when is this, when is the time frame that it's performing the best? Um, so we're going to be able to communicate that information here soon. Um, so we're, we're excited about that. We love to hear feedback. Um, that's how, that's how this stuff gets better is people reach out. Um, so please, please, please reach out. Um, we like to think that we're, we're, we can be worked with. So, um, please, uh, please continue to reach out and provide feedback. Um, really, really helps us quite a bit. Um, also, there is a PROB WSSI and a deterministic WSSI winter uh, course uh, in the WTT Walk Winter Courses um, catalog available now. Um, so here's an example of, um, there's that, uh, those links over here uh, within the uh, warning operations course. And this page also is meant to be shared around as just uh, some links uh, that you might find useful. Uh, we have the, the rolling 30-day archive link here. Um, the, uh, the, we have a rolling 24 hour display page as well. Um, and I would also point you to this quick reference guide. If you just have like, this is kind of like a three page memo thing. Um, this is a, just a, a quick set of slides that highlights the climatology, what the changes were for deterministic WSSI, prob WSSI and travel this year. So um, I'd point you to that if you just want a quick reference, um, uh, um, if you just had a quick question. 
Um, if there, if you do have any specific questions, please feel free to contact Jim or myself. Um, Sarah Perfader can also um, be contacted for for any program level um, kind of conversations. Uh, and then Dana and myself are always available to answer any questions. We love hearing from the field, so um, uh, please send all your questions away. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to present today, and look forward to engaging with you all this 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 season. So. Uh, thank you, Phil, for, for the opportunity to talk again.